All right. Okay. So, um, hello everyone. Um, happy New Year first. Um, happy 2023. Um, this is our very first museum seminar for the new year. And um, today it's uh, my pleasure to welcome to um, our first speaker for 2023, Dr. Ryo uh, Sugima Sugimura um, from, uh, from Hong Kong University. So um, <clears throat> Rio actually, um, very brief introduction uh, for Rio. Uh, Rio received his MD training from Osaka University, uh, Japan in 2008. And then following <clears throat> with his PhD training in stem cells and regeneration uh, from the uh, Storrs Institute uh, for Medical Research in Kansas uh, in 2012. Um, after he completed his um, PhD training, uh, he continued his uh, research as a postdoc fellow uh, in uh, Kyoto University in Japan and then following uh, with, sorry, first of all is um, postdoc training in Boston Children's Hospital in Harvard Medical School. And then he became research scientist in Kyoto University in Japan. Um, so, um, so he got a start his own independent research program as an assistant professor in the School of uh, Biomedical Sciences in the University of Hong Kong. And then um, Rio is a full faculty member of the stem cell and regeneration section and a co-founder of the uh, medical branch of um, uh, Kagakusa uh, Network. So Rio is a very accomplished uh, scientist uh, which uh, he is was uh, he is recognized for his outstanding contribution to the field of uh, hematology and stem cell biology. So his lab is mainly interested in using single cell barcoding technology to delineate uh, single cell lineage maps of blood immune cells in human organoids, and then exploring uh, druggable targets of anti cancer immunity. His major contribution, including. I identification of the crucial cell uh, metabolisms that regulate blood stem cells and the exploration of the genetic program to specify blood um, stem cell from human uh, iPS cell uh, stem cell. Uh, before joining um, uh, University of Hong Kong, uh, Rio also established a platform for um, human immune cell generating uh, organoids and an organ on chip uh, technology. So um, based on his achievement, we will get uh, numerous awards. Uh, he is a recipient of the ASH uh, Scholar Award, March of Diamonds, Early Career uh, Grant from Japanese Administrate, and Genius Award from Young uh, Hematologist Meeting in Japan, um, Takeda Science Foundation, IPS Academy, Japanese uh, Japan Foundation, and also the SMRF Fellowship uh, from uh, Kane uh, Hara Memorial Foundation and then uh, Uhara Memorial Foundation. So I think uh, without further ado, uh, we're going to uh, talk to about uh, to us today about his uh, recent work on the um, uh, immutual point in human embryonic uh, organoids. So thank you so much, Rio, to join us uh, and then deliver the lecture for us today. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much for introduction. I'm very much happy to attend, I mean, giving some seminar in this series. So I am Rio from University of Hong Kong. and basically have done a lot of research on stem cells and hematopoiesis. And my laboratory more like currently shifting onto immunology, cancer immunotherapy. And today I'm going to talk about two preprints from our lab. So the talk title is, is the role of immuno checkpoint in human embryonic organoids. So I will be starting from our organoid system. Let me see, I can move the slide. Yes. So we are basically two years old laboratory. Yeah, we began during pandemic, like late 2020. And we very much trying to establish a platform and technology to contribute to cancer immunotherapy using stem cell technology. We are blood engineering laboratory. So essentially we do a functional immunocellus from iPS cells. Uh, we do a fundamental research on immuno checkpoint and uh, like any uh, innate immunosystem like molecular switch using barcode platform. 
We ultimately aim to remodel tumor microenvironment using PAL T cells, NK, and macrophages. So our mission is to contribute to immunotherapy, especially hepatocellular carcinoma, which is a lot in Hong Kong. So starting from first preprint from our lab, single cell spatial temporal temp analysis of human embryonic organoid. So it has been done by two PhD candidates in our laboratory. One is Yi Min Chao, an uh, informatics student in our laboratory. And let me give a laser pointer thing. Yes, yeah. And David, another PhD candidate who has done all the wet experiments. So as a stem cell scientist, originally trained like more tissue stem cells and move on to like human ES, IPS cells, I still believe the power of stem cells in modeling embryonic development. Like not like, you know, uh, distracting, exploiting real embryo from human, but we will be able to model it. So this has been done by uh, two major studies last year from Magda and Jakob Hanna Laboratories. I show the picture here. You will be able to reconstruct an uh, entire structure and whole embryonic process using mouse, IPS, or ES cells. Um, basically, same thing to be done using human IPS cells. Essentially, that's a test. So here we collaborate with Pentao Liu uh, in same department in HKU, Hong Kong University. They previously established a chemically defined condition that push human ES or IPS cells into much higher hierarchy, like naive stem cells, like Austin Smith does. And we use this platform, Adaptly, and um, very much cross, or maybe even some cases superior to conventional naive IPS or ES cells that has a capacity to make not only AP blast, but also hypoblast, yolk sac, and trophoblast placental compartment. So that case, like a single cell, can become an entire structure of embryo, which is already shown in mouse and also a uh, human tissue, I mean, human IPS cells too. And we use this uh, naive right PSCs, IPS cells of human, and try to establish like entire components, or at least like a certain uh, region of embryonic components, as well as extra embryonic tissue like placenta in vitro. So we have uh, this organoid platform starting from human, like which we, they call expanded potential stem cells, like uh, naive PSCs, and differentiate into human embryonic organoids in vitro using 3D structure. And we have done a time series of single cell anesthetic 10 x chromium and 10 x vision spatial transdomings. So this is how our organoid looks like in the end basically 18 days protocol, and each time point we check several components by 10x chromium, basically which we call HEMO, human embryonic organoids follow the course of embryonic development of human. Like we usually see trophoblast, placental component, yolk sac, hypoblast, and then AP blast components are coming like blood vessels, and eventually we see a uh, more emergence of neural ectoderm, neural crest, cardiac mesoderm, and enrichment of hematopoietic components like erythroblast, monocyte, melatiocyte. So that basically convinced us that like, we will be able to mimic certain aspect of early human embryonic development. And let's use this as a platform for us to not only analyze gene expression signature, but eventually we will be able to, I mean, we will be move this one onto a platform to produce useful cell type like CAR, T, NK, and microphage. So that has been our motivation using this system. Yeah, before moving on to like those blood engineer, we, uh, we would like to validate if this consistent with like previous knowledge of hematopoiesis, because I am like a blood person. So asking an velocity a technique, which can see an maturation and see trajectory of cells 
we basically consistently observe mediatorial poiesis from HPC, I mean, progenitors to mediatorial site. Same case we saw in myelopoiesis, like common myeloid progenitor becoming granulomyelocyte progenitor into monocyte. That one can be eventually maturated into macrophage. I'll be talking later on. And then we further asked, like, a limitation of 10x chromy is a lack of spatial information. So even though we see a multi-lineage, like lots of several components, but people can want to argue, is this just a mix of mono-lineage organoid or actually multi-lineage? Like uh, each organoid possess such a multi-potential, multi-lineage cell types. Then we have done a 10x vision. I mean, like this is, I guess, nowadays the routine in many other laboratories. So we have done tissue section of those organoids, and we were able to see like multi lineage, like each organoid contains a lot of subtype. But since our organoids, unlike, you know, a primary tissue of human or mice, these are basically 100 to 500 micrometer dimension, I mean, size. So it's basically small. A uh, limitation of 10x vision here is low resolution. I'm going to talk on how to solve this problem later on. So principally, I was not satisfied by this like low resolution of 10x vision. Like this is how they look like. We have a HE section staining. We can see a spot, like this green spot contain maybe 30 to 40 cells that 10x vision call out it a single event, like a one cell, which is not the case. So how we can deconvolute this like a low resolution thing and can call out each cell type per spot? So we collaborated with like uh, another university, like University of um, HDA-USD, just nearby next university to HDAU, and collaborated with the Department of Mathematics and using machine learning and the technique they call spatial scope. We basically educate this platform, I mean like algorithm, to distinguish each event using our paired single cell RNAC data set and this HE section, nuclear staining, and trying to annotate each spot of vision much further in like a uh, deeper resolution. So this is how it looks like. Of course, not like uh, exactly single cell, but I would say it's better than before. Like previously, they call like a one spot is now having more than five to eight spots. So and you can see a more like repertoire of multi lineage cells. So this is what we have so far, like how we improve like limitation of 10x vision and potentially useful for small structure like organoid. And this is how they look like in reality. So out of 10 organoids, we saw uh, eight of them were multi-lineage, like having yolk sac, mediatiocyte, erythroblast, and also torophoblast. Two of them were like these blue guys were predominantly placenta but others are more like multi-lineage thing. And then we basically focus on, I mean, we exemplify like one organoid that possess yolk sac niche. Like they are having erythrocyte, mediatiocyte, its progenitors, and yolk sac endoderm. And they are making some cluster together, which is basically consistent with a classical, I mean, more prevailing method called RCTD. Uh, we basically saw a same kind of result. So making sure uh, our new technique spatial scope consistent with like previously established method. Then we took our immunofluorescence tissue section and saw yolk sac components like blood island, which is a cluster of CD71 erythroblast around uh, our yolk sac organoid. And that is how they look like on the tissue section. And um, it is very similar to like a real human yolk sac staining. Then further, we ask molecular signature of those yolk sac niche. 
um, we pay attention to military policies featured by vitrodecting and integrating ITG to be that has been consistently predominant in our York Sack and Drone and military site, which is actually the same case as primary human fetal sample, York Sack single cell anesthetic done by previous other laboratory. Also, in, we deep mining the data set and found York Sack epi cellular cells express vitrodecton and military site express integrity receptors. So the basically case like we are very much molecularly close to real human yoksa in regard of metatio poises. So that has been already preprinted like this story. We have like story of human embryo development and we observe yoksa to niche metatio site with ronectin integrity signal. And also further, we investigate neural crest maturation process, which is governed by wind signaling coming from trophy blast. And all those data sets are available online. Then we move on to our next stage. So what can we do from this hemo? I mean, this human embryonic organoid, not only like a system trying to understand fundamental question of early human embryo, but I see this as a useful platform to generate useful cell type for immunotherapy. Like we routinely make NK cells and microphages from there. I mean, this is a 3D image of our organoid. We see a cluster of CD45 hematopoietic cells, and that's basically vascularized. And we see uh, some structure, right? So it's very much clustered on blood on some part. Then let's see, uh, this is also uh, coming out, this protocol is coming out soon from our lab, NK cells from HEMO. We made a uh, functional NK cells. That one can degranulate upon stimulation. We see a lamp one, a lysosomal associated membrane protein one coming to surface upon the stimulation by cytokines. And further, functionally, we define tumor killing assay of those NK cells, co culture with K562, and we demonstrate our NK cells can kill cancers. Microphages are much easier. Obviously, like this is one of my favorite cell type. You can make microphage from hemo by further induction in cytokine like MCSF. Uh, they stimulate by, I mean, they can respond to cytokine stimulation like pro-inflammatory factors produced. If you add IL-4, they produce anti-inflammatory cytokines and morphologically very much microphages. So we use this platform like further engineer cells, like putting chimeric antigen receptor and more other payload. So this is actually a main part of my laboratory. But then uh, I'm going to talk a uh, lot of interesting story. We are now submitting, I mean, already preprinted just last month, PDL1 function in microphage development. So this was originally came from my broad idea, like that ball sort. Like if PDL1 is such an anti-inflammatory, why don't you knock out PDL1, make our microphage resistant to tumor microenvironment? So coming from that, we basically knocked out PDL1 and trying to understand how good our microphage for cancer immunotherapy. That was my original point. But um, this story can branch out into more interesting direction. So I'm talking this one like uh, last half part of my talk. Done by Handy, our postdoc, Shifui, another informatics student, and again, David did a lot of knockout. So PDL1, quite a famous molecule, like a binding partner of PD1. Basically, PDL1 expressed like in tumor cells or tumor associated macrophage and the suppressed T cells, which express PD1. So, PD1, a lot of study has been done. Like, we understand basically downstream molecular event and how they suppress T cells. But PDL1, like on the part, not much, no, honestly. People believe this will be just like some sticking pole which interact with T3PD1 and suppress T cells. But 
not much of things if PDL1 does something in like the themselves. So here is a review uh, summarizing non canonical role of PDL1, which is very like, you know, a small intracellular domain, but indeed they have some like modification part there. And not only like uh, just a sticking pole on the surface. Actually, people already demonstrate PDL1 can go into cytoplasm and further nucleus and function as transcription factor. So that has been kind of a uh, our motivation, maybe this molecule might have something to do with like immunocells. In the PD era has been already established in hematopoietic field by Nancy Spain. In this paper, they identified the PD era expressed in fetal liver HSC and can be a useful marker of stem cell differentiation. But actually, PD era in this case not function. If you knock out mouse fetal liver HEC, not affected. So basically adjust the marker in this very early time point of blood development. But no one knows. I mean, we don't know like what would be a function of this PDL1 in more mature immunocells like macrophage. So we asked like what could be the role of PDL1 in immunocell development. And uh, since we have a robust system of macrophage from hemo. We basically analyze whether PD element expressed. Yes, it's kind of yeah, consistent with other people. If you induce and if you stimulate by interferon gamma, I mean, that's a routine technique to make inflammatory macrophage in vitro. You induce PD element. And yes, we observe PD element expression when you add interferon gamma in the culture media. And then we knocked out PD one using CRISPR Cas9, got homozygous stem cells, and differentiate into macrophage. And this is basically we also verified our knockout by immunofluorescence, not only facts. And we saw a PD one in white type cells macrophage, not only through surface, but also inside personal and also in the nucleus, potentially indicating PD one does not only through surface function, but probably some role in the nucleus, like a transcription factor previously people reported. And of course, knockout, we have no signal. Then what we found was, I mean, consistently what we saw was loss of PD one reduced macrophage development in vitro. So this is our cytospin. We saw a loss, I mean, lack of like a big cells and flow cytometry CD45 and 11B more clearly show a 60% reduction of macrophage. And that has been consistent in different stem cell lines. We further found copied by pharmacological inhibition of PDL1 using drug. Uh, same thing. We saw a 50% reduction of macrophage from stem cells. Then we asked expression profile of those macrophage, and upon knockout, we saw a uh, critical transcription factors, like macrophage specific transcription factors reduced, like SPI1, KLF6, and MAFB, explaining a developmental program of macrophage has been affected. We further asked what is a feature of those macrophages? Are those are more inflammatory or not? And what we found was knockout macrophage basically more skew into anti-inflammatory. So they reduce inflammatory signatures like NF kappa B, T, and F. And the only thing I saw upregulate was TG beta, which is anti-inflammatory signature. And further consistently, we saw a collagen. Expression of collagen has been increased in knockout macrophage. That implied uh, its feature of anti-inflammatory macrophage. So this basically indicates PDL1 knockout reduce macrophage development, and the macrophage has become more anti-inflammatory. One of the biggest feature we observed was loss reduction of interferon gamma signature, like interferon stimulatory gene, ISGs, has been quite down-regulated. 
So initially we thought that has been like one of another demonstration of a uh, lack of inflammatory program because interferon has been one of the key feature of inflammatory macrophage and interferon downstream gene has been very much reduced. But when we come to uh, this protocol, what we are routinely using, we actually keep adding interferon jump in this culture medium, because that's basically for uh, making pro-inflammatory macrophage in vitro. So we have interferon gamma in medium, but its downstream response genes were reduced. In the case, our knockout macrophage became somehow deaf, cannot respond to interferon gamma in the medium. How it happens? So we checked expression of its receptor, interferon gamma, and alpha receptors, uh, they were pretty much decreased in a uh, PDL1 knockout, partially explaining that our knockout macrophage cannot respond to interferon gamma in culture medium. And since interferon gamma is one of the key signals which induce inflammatory macrophage, whose lack, lack, I mean, whose lack of receptors indicate they are not be able to go into inflammatory macrophage. So this is uh, still ongoing some analysis, but actually we have a preprint of this data. PDL1 predominantly expressed in inflammatory macrophage from stem cells and its deletion blocked macrophage development and interferon gamma response has been reduced. Our working model is PDL1 maintains interferon gamma response in macrophage development. So what is a consequence of this observation? How clinically important? Actually, yeah, there is a very interesting observation in clinics that PDL1 inhibitor, which has been used for anti-cancer treatment and in patients, actually, they increase anti-inflammatory M2 macrophage in the tumor, which is consistent with our observation that PDL1 deletion impaired inflammatory macrophage and more skewed into anti-inflammatory phenotype. So those are two preprints we are already, I mean, uploaded on bioarchive and all the raw data, single cell analytic data are available. And I'd like to basically summarize what we are currently doing. So we would like to remodel the tumor microenvironment using those hemo and engineer immunocells by chimeric antigen receptor. And we are currently establishing a novel organoid system, which is an assembly oil of tumor organoid and our hemo which possess blood vessel and any type of immunosuppressors you want. Um, we are very much backed up by strong computational approach like molecular barcoding and analyzing the origin of those immunosuppressors. And we'd like to acknowledge our laboratory members, collaborators, and the funding source. And yeah, yes, those data are available online. And thanks so much for uh, this invitation. So this is uh, my last slide. And so yeah, thanks to our previous laboratory members and current members, funding source, and we are still recruiting students and postdocs.